Hi, welcome to Convince Me Audio. This has been four years of build up that I finally have a platform to actually talk about. Welcome to the review of the Bowers and Wilkins P9 Signatures, absolutely notorious in the audiophile community, whether you love it or you hate it. Here is the Convince Me Audio perspective. Four years back, I was in the process of picking up the Sennheiser HD 800S. Unfortunately, I no longer have those here, but I will be bringing one in for review because I think they deserve it even in 2021. Um, especially with the recent announcements from Sennheiser that they have sold their consumer division for audio, which is very, very sad. I was waiting for the HD800S, which was going to arrive within a matter of weeks, but I needed something out of the blue. For absolutely no reason, I said, oh, Bowers and Wilkins, I absolutely love their Diamond Series speakers. Oh, I can't wait to get those in for review at some point, but that will be a long time coming, I think. We haven't started on speaker reviews on this channel just yet, but they are coming. Let's see what they do with their headphones. I mean, their P7s and their P5s and stuff are rather loved throughout our audiophile community, which is wonderful. This is their 50 year anniversary edition, the Bowers and Wilkins P9 Signatures. I have absolutely no idea what I was expecting. Now, let's do a hardware tour before we actually get into my perspective, what I think. A lot of this review will be subjective. Obviously, there will be objective parts as well, but this is more of a rant slash love letter slash therapy session, I think. It's more for me <laughs> and my sanity than for the product itself, but be that as it may. This headphone is made of metal, Alcantara leather, and this nylon bulletproof material that they use in certain cars, and I think it might be even be bulletproof. It's absolutely insane. I've had this for four years, 2,000 hours on this thing, and not a scratch on it. Absolutely perfect. So, the arms on this thing slide in and out like this, you would think on your head, these would change size very frequently. In fact, once the arms are extended like this and they sit on your head like this, it's almost impossible to move these arms. What you have to do is this. Push it in, slide on the fly so you can adjust it to your preference. But most people just adjust it like this and then put it on their head. It's an interesting system. I usually prefer the clicks. It's a little bit better for the OCD and for the sole, but it works and it works well. Second of all, these fold like this, but don't be deceived. This headphone is not for portable use out and about. They are semi-open and they leak just as much as an open back headphone. Uh, the headband flexes like this so that it will accommodate your head. But here is where the first problem begins. If you've got a small head and you're fortunate enough to have a nice round head and a nice shape, you can extend the arms a little bit like this and then extend the headband like this and it will sit on your head perfectly. Because what happens is when the arms are closer to the headband itself, this fills up with air. Somewhat a bit of an over-engineering uh, thing that didn't need to be there. The pad here is very, very thin, but what happens is the sides fill up with air so that this becomes an air cushion sitting on your head like this. But if you've got a large head and you need to pull the arms all the way out and this headphone doesn't extend a great deal, you get this. And when you get this, you get absolutely no air and no padding, because what happens is it's overstretched and your head sits right against this thing, causing hot spots. Right off the bat, your head shape makes a big difference. Second of all, the cups. Absolutely beautiful steel design. It's on this gimbal that moves backwards and forwards, up and down in a completely 360 degree field in a vertical axis, which is wonderful. Uh, second of all, we have the cups that are attachable via magnets. Thank you so much. So we have Meze Audio, P9 Signatures, Apple, and Abyss implementing this magnetic 
coupling and decoupling of pads, thank you so much. It helps a great deal. As you can see, the pads are dual layered. Now, the underside has got this foam here and the leather on top of it like this. This padding is only a third deep. This, as, this much of it, literally almost two thirds, is housing for this fabric part of the leather pad, which basically gives you very little cushioning. If the whole of this was pads, that would have mitigated the second problem of comfort. Let's move on. So these pads are hybrids. Foam underneath, this type of felt, and then leather. Because 70% of the tuning comes from the pads. That's where our third problem begins. Be that as it may. So the driver's covered by this mesh here, and the drivers are tilted forward so that it throws all the image in front of you in a speaker-like presentation, and it works. A lot of headphones actually are implementing this new feature where their drivers are angled forward like this, which is wonderful. So this build quality is akin to this baby here, the Abyss Diana V2. They are so similar in size, in weight. It, it, it's, it's literally like Abyss went, how can we perfect the P9 signature build quality? Let's make the pads bigger. Let's make the headband more comfortable. Let's give a larger opening to the pads because this is perfect for my ears. But if you've got large ears, it's gonna become on ears. If you've got small ears, you're fine. So basically the Diana V2 is the perfected hardware version of this. You really can't argue about the build quality. It's stunning. After four years of use, 2000 hours on the drivers. Then we have the cable. When I first actually got this cable, I yelled out loud because I thought it was gonna be a beats copy of the cable but it's not no audiophonics absolutely stunning perfectly straight never keeps its shape and this has lasted four years you think to yourself how do you connect this there's absolutely no connectors is this thing bluetooth was it wireless hell no what happens is you take the cup off like that and inside here where this housing is you take the cable it's got a flat proprietary edge so you've got absolutely no chance of ever replacing this cable it goes inside the cup like this you lift this bit and it goes and it blends in with a driver like that flat and then you put the pad on again like this and then the headphone magically becomes a wired headphone so that if this ever gets tangled in something it will yank the headphone off of your head and give you a nasty tug which has happened more than once. So the cable feels weird, but it's actually very, very, very durable. Set that aside, fine. I have spent the last 15 minutes pointing out good things and bad things about the hardware. It literally is one for another. But let's say you have forgiven all of this because for your head shape and your head size, it fits perfectly. Air up on the sides, cushion up top, pads around your ears, and the bottom part of the pad will sit on your earlobes, it just does. You can wear it with glasses. Ergonomically, hit and miss. Completely depends on you, 100%. Let's move over to the next section, which is not going to be sound. I'm going to have to start timestamp this because this review is gonna be long. I've got a lot to say, and there's a lot of things that I would like to correct from other reviewers that they've had problems with because they're all true, that's the thing. They're not mistaken, not a single one of them. The good ones are absolutely correct and the very awful reviews are absolutely correct too in the same sentence. I will link DMS's review down here. You can check it out. He hates these more than any other headphone. I will link Zeos's review down here and obviously you're watching this review yourself. So you can compare all three because I'm telling you the experience from person to person will vary but I will explain to you why these things are happening. Going back to the intro, I picked up these headphones and said, okay, these headphones are like 16 ohm and 103 decibels or something. So they're very, very easy to drive in quotes, very easy to drive. So you can throw it on anything, but like anything else that's easy to drive, to get it driving properly is a nightmare. I think these might be one of the most difficult, complicated, annoying, irritating, wonderful, amazing, incredible headphones you will find if you can put in the effort and the time. 
most people will not. Because the Diana V2 at five times the price, you have none of those issues. It just works. My first impressions. When I took it out of the box, oh my God, what the hell have I done? I've spent 700 pounds on this thing, this is awful. Then I proceeded to let it burn in for 50 hours straight. Put it back on my head and went, oh God, these pads are uncomfortable, it's too hard. But wow, what's happening to the mid-range? I can actually hear it, it's opening up. This is interesting, but the base region is awful. There was resonances in the ear canal that just weren't dissipating. The drivers in this thing are so powerful. The piston drivers push so much air, it feels like it's kicking your eardrum out of the side of your head. So more burning. These took in about 175 hours of burning before they stabilized. And a lot happened in that time, in the treble region, in the mid range, and most especially in the base. So I burnt it in and I had a listen. I first put it on this behind me here, the Oppo HA2AC. It seems like these two can go together. Metal, leather, absolute beauty. I will actually be doing a review of this because I think everybody should own one. They're very cheap now. I think you can get hold of these pretty cheap, um, but everybody should own one. It sounded V-shaped. The bass was overly exaggerated. The treble was overly exaggerated. It hurt my ears. Did not care for it much. And then I put it on my old Jotunheim from Sheet. Completely different sound. Sounded absolutely nothing like this. Like so different that I thought I was wearing a different set of headphones. Those were more glary, more mid forward, more punchy, very bizarre. Then that intrigue and that understanding became a bit more of a disease that began to grow. I began to test these with so many DACs, so many amplifiers over those four years. And EQ presets, and I'm not talking about the old crap jazz and things like that. The actual EQ presets of manufacturers, whatever curve they're using, had an impact on these. These in fact became so notorious that I used to use it exclusively for amp and DAC testing because it immediately tells you what's new in your chain and how it's different. Then I realized something else, that these pads are as complicated, because look, it bounces back very slowly, are as complicated as freaking IEMs. You know you can have five different experiences depending on what tip you use on IEMs. This is the equivalent of that. These take 15 to 20 minutes to get a perfect seal around your ears. And if you happen to be moving these pads around your head like this to try and get a comfortable position every five minutes, you will never hear how these headphones sound like because you're literally resetting. Can you believe what I'm saying? This is retarded. This is insane. This is just not normal. But once you get that perfect seal, because you've stopped moving this around and this sits like this against your ear, you realize you've got a perfect seal because the mid range opens up, the bass region drops by about five dB and the treble opens up. Have I complained enough yet? Should we keep going or should we actually start talking about the good things? I think we should move on to the sound. I will first talk about when you have the perfect seal, the perfect synergy with the amp and DAC you've chosen, and I will come back to what is good and what isn't bad, because it's time to talk about the good things of this. Using a Hugo 2 or a Chord Cutest, using a Sennheiser HDVD 820, perfect synergy. These headphones, even now, are nipping at the heels of this $3,000 monster. You're paying $900 for this, MSRP. I think you can get it cheaper now. Their timbre is absolutely exceptional. There is no color to the sound. It's transparent, it's see-through. The texture of voice, the imaging, the bass impact is freaking insane. So much so, when you have the perfect synergy, subjectively speaking, from somebody who has owned and reviewed more headphones in the last year alone, let alone over the last 16 years, than I can count for imaging is as good as a Focal Clear MG. For the bass attack, it's as good as a Focal Clear OG. For timbre, it beats Aria. For soundstage, it's on par with the MG and OG. It's, it's a small soundstage. 
I would say intimate, but it has the perfect capability to move backwards and forwards. So let's break down the frequency response, starting with the bass region. This thing goes low. When you've got the perfect seal, when you've got the perfect control, and also they soak up so much power. They just soak up so much power, it's insane. I have thrown three watts at this, and it's just taking it like a champ. The sub bass region is clear, distinct, defined, textured, and it has the capability to separate itself from individual instruments in the lower bass region wonderfully. The authority and impact and the resonance of the bass region is incredible, especially for real instruments. Wind instruments, string instruments, double bass, cello, viola sound stunning on this thing. EDM music like Infected Mushroom, absolutely stunning. LCDX worthy. Just find the right synergy. The bass region in the sub area is quick. It reacts instantly to change, but with the slightest of bad synergy, it can become bloated and overpowering. It's like a pendulum. You need to find the right spot slowly and then use that thing and don't change it. But the authority is there. The slam is there. The impact is there. It's all there for the taking. Moving up to the mid-range, this is where things get a bit tricky again. When you've got the perfect synergy and the perfect source, because it doesn't work on everything, it's punchy. The attack is quick. It's excellent. It's vibrant. The cadence is perfect. But if the source does not match this between it and the lower mid-range, it becomes bloated. And funnily enough, it doesn't impeach on anything else. It just becomes irritating. Not a fun sound signature to listen to. But when the synergy is perfect and you've got a good song and it's mastered well, the balance between it and the sub bass, the synergy and the collaboration between the two is absolutely wonderful. I didn't get that. Could you try again? <laughs> That is what every single other reviewer who come across this review will be saying. <laughs> oh my God. I think I will leave that in there because I think that actually defines what is going to happen with this review. The upper bass region, um, again, can sometimes impeach on the lower mid range if the source is badly mixed or if the power delivery is incorrect. Because in the 600 and 800 Hertz region, it can do some very, very funky things, um, depending on the amplifier or DAC or source you're using. Um, but when it's perfect, it's authoritative and it actually works in perfect collaboration with the lower treble region and the mid treble region so well, so that when you get the bam of uh, drums, in things like trailers and things, or classical music, when they're trying to make a point, it's very weighty. And the bounce, and the spring, and the depth of the skin is all there for the taking. The resolution is actually very high on these headphones. Surprisingly so, even if they're dark. Um, it has a little bit more of the treble region extension than the Diana V2s here, but it's not as smooth as the Diana V2s. It has a little bit more edge to instruments and this can go out of kilter if the DAC or the amp is a little bit too bright or the DAC is a little bit too bright. Uh, a perfect example would be the Sankas SGD1 which we just reviewed earlier. This is not a good pairing but this with something a little more rounded, a little more organic and real sounding like the Spring 2L4 back here that's when you get magic. Absolute magic. And then we move over to the treble region. The treble region is very, very well extended, very detailed, like very, very detailed, but not in your face, as part of the instrument, as part of the synergy. It works really well. And at times, it can really hurt, depending on the source and the amplifier you're using. This headphone, is a headache. It's like an old banger of a car. When it works, it's magic. 
and you find that guy working on it every Sunday, and he has been for the last 20 years. It's that kind of calibre. Let's talk about imaging, layering, microdynamics, dynamics, because it coincides together. The imaging on this thing is absolutely stunning. No impeachment from the sub bass to the mid bass to the upper bass, to the mid range to the treble. When instruments come in off axis and overlap each other, it looks like a whirlpool. It looks like a whirlpool with little waves all going over and under and over each other with perfect clarity. And they can move out and come right into your face. The higher the resolution of the source, the better the mix, the more performance you get. These scale with equipment insanely well, an insane amount. You get the whole pushing down on the keys of a piano. You get the whole fingers running up and down a fretboard. You get the grit, the bite of a bow on a violin with the high resolution and that beautiful transparent mid-range that just sparkle and shimmers. You can reach out and touch everything, but the pads need to seal, the DAC needs to be good, and the amplifier needs to have the right amount of power. Not too much power, not too little power, the right amount of power for these drivers. If Bowers and Wilkins ever come across this video randomly, I would like to speak to the engineer that tuned this on what equipment because it's so specific, it's insane. The imaging is exceptional on this. The detail is exceptional on this. You will even get micro detail. The subtle elements of buzzings of amplifier cabs, the subtle nuances of people shifting ever so slightly on a chair or leaning backwards and forwards from a microphone. It's observable. I would say for micro detail, this might have less than the P9 signatures. The timbre is very good. Instruments sound real. They've got a real tonality, organic tonality to it. You can throw any genre of music at these uh, headphones, from EDM to jazz to classical to rock, but the source has to be good in that genre. That's the problem. They're not smooth, but when the source is right, it's great. Let me paint you a picture. You've been asked to close your eyes and then ask to open them again. You find yourself in a transparent snow globe with perfect circular edges above and around. In the center point of the snow globe, where there is usually a house, a little tiny house, you have the vocals and you have the bass region on this thing. And then somebody shakes the snow globe and all the sound goes everywhere, below, above, around. And that's all the other instruments. And each of those specific snowflakes have got the capability to go anywhere in this globe, up or down, left or right, diagonal, low, right, to up, left, and vice versa. The imaging is stunning. And akin to a globe that's been shook hard, the house, will slam against the sides of the glass. And that's the base region. It comes and it goes and it attacks violently, viscerally. Little elements of sound will shimmer all around. And yet there is just enough space to bypass some of the others. Like on the Diana V2, sometimes you feel there is too many sounds, perfectly positioned, perfectly in unity with each other, but you want a bigger stage to appreciate all of it because there isn't enough space to actually walk around each individual sound. But each one is distinct, nothing's overlapping, nothing is impeaching, but you want more space. And a little of that can be found here, 100%. So within this snow globe, each little snowflake is a sound. The more reverb and delay there is on a track, the higher resolution those filters have been used, the more open, beautiful, and airy and massive this sounds. The more acoustically treated studio environment songs you get, the more forward in your face it becomes. 
sometimes a little claustrophobic. Not always, but sometimes. The nuances of microphones and vocals is so audible that you immediately go, you're way too close to the microphone. Step back a little bit, you know? That is easily detectable. I think you've got a vague idea about these headphones. You might either be running away or be very intrigued to actually experience it for yourself. Let's talk about the synergy aspect of these headphones. The best pairing I have found for this has been the HDVD820 and the Cord Cutest. The next best one has been the Topping A90 and the Spring from Hollow Audio. Absolutely stunning. For on the go, funnily enough, it's been this little thing. The ES100 from Ear Studio. It works like magic for on the go. That's what I use when I'm walking around the house. I haven't been using these headphones for a very long time um, because of all the other reviews. But in the last few days to get this review underway, I've been using this. And the current presets of neutrality and off from Apple is working great with this right now. I can't tell you that for tomorrow because for some reason, Apple have got this irritating tendency with every software update to touch off mode of their filters. So technically, there is nothing implied like jazz and all that kind of horrible bad EQ presets. It should just be flat. But that flat frequency response completely changes software to software. Right now, it's perfect. It's been absolutely wonderful. You could have an awful time with this headphone or you could have an incredible time with this headphone. Let me talk about the subjectivity completely from my part. I have tested a lot of headphones. I have tested a lot of IEMs and speakers. But for every single one of us, every single one of you out there who's watching this review right now, there is something out there that sings to your soul, that brings tears to your eyes, and that you just love, despite what anyone else thinks. The organic nature of these headphones and the realism, and when the synergy is perfect, balanced with my own hearing, with all the dips and peaks that my hearing has, seem to collide together in perfect harmony. I think I enjoy these headphones and have enjoyed these headphones despite, I swear to God, they've given me white hairs more than any other headphone, including Sasvara's over there, which are the best headphone on the planet. I'm pretty sure the 1266TC has something to say about that, but that's coming in for review, so hang around. These beautiful things. I bought within 48 hours of hearing them that have become my daily driver is basically a perfect version of these. Thank you, Bowers and Wilkins. Despite the irritating, irritating synergy for these headphones and the annoying pads that need proper seal and proper time, I don't think I've ever enjoyed any other audio product as much as I've the, enjoyed these. I love them so much. But after 2000 hours of use, I am forwarding this because they've been sold. I want someone else who appreciates and will appreciate them the way I do. And I want them to experience it and actually tell me what they think too. So these are leaving. And it's the end of an era for me because over the last three days, I've been trying to talk myself out of actually breaking that deal because I can't, I can't. I don't want to. I love them so much. In fact, I love them so much. When I'm walking around with my coffee in the morning, like I've been doing the last three days reviewing this with this ES100 Bluetooth adapter and my iPhone, lossless music. If you ask me, come and sit down, Sasvara's are ready. I'll just say in a minute. Thank you. I've had so much to say. I think I've exercised some demon that was inside. I think I can put these to rest now. Because you reviewers out there that have reviewed this, those of you who love it, those of you who hate it, I hope I have given some of the reasons why your experiences have been like that. And that you should reach out, if it comes across your path, and give these another try and implement what I have stated. I would like to take a moment to thank my Patreon members for keeping the Audio Land chat alive.
Thank you, boys. You are wonderful and thank you for supporting the channel. And the audience, I would like to thank you for getting us past 500 subscribers. Absolutely amazing in such a short amount of time. I really do appreciate it. I will see you next time. I'm Koji CEO. Peace.